Make sure you share that on your social media platforms right now. I need you to go live. I need you to make sure you let everybody know that we are live here at The Dig right now. Right now, go online, grab the link on YouTube, and share that on your social media pages right away. Do that right now. Week three of The Dig. Week three of Yeah, week three of the dig. We go there right now. Make sure you share it, and uh, I'm excited about it. And so tonight's uh, culmination of events. We're going to start off uh, kind of small recap, a little bit of our uh, First Corinthians, and then we're going to go right into uh, some other stuff. But listen, before we get into that, I want to let you guys know that on tomorrow night, I get a chance to interview a very special man of God. He's actually my father in the Lord, my spiritual father in the Lord. And I'm excited about that. He was my pastor. Uh, he licensed me and ordained me and sent us out to do a work in, in Jesus' name. So tomorrow night in San Antonio, we'll be having what we call Legacy Conversations. It's the first uh, of its sort, the first of its nature. And so I want you to make sure if you're in San Antonio, make sure you're here. If you're not in San Antonio, don't worry about it. We will be live tomorrow night on our and streaming from our from our YouTube page to let everybody know the legacy conversation is happening. We're talking about things of the kingdom, history with God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I want you to be a part of that. If you can on tomorrow night, it's going to be an incredible time of sharing and partaking, a sit down conversation. I think you guys are going to like it. It's going to be, it's going to be brilliant. It's the first time we've ever done something like this. And I'm excited to, to, for you, for you, for you to hear his story and for uh, you to hear his story with God and, all that good stuff. It's going to be fun. So make sure, especially if you're in San Antonio, I want to see you in the place. Let's let the, let's let the bishop know we love him. Let's get ready to start. We'll move right into an incredible moment uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll start at 9. And tonight, our culmination will be at chapter 16. So we're going to go from 9 to 16. It's going to be quite aggressive. And so I need you to flow with me tonight. I'm excited about it. Again, make sure you share tonight's dig link with somebody who's hungry for the word of God and hungry for Bible study. But not just Bible study in the traditional sense, but Bible study from a historical perspective. So can't wait for you to jump in with me. Let's do it tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all of those uh, that are part of this particular uh, opportunity uh, with the dig. Lord, I thank you for every man, every woman uh, that's, that's assembled to this moment. Lord, we give you praise for it. Thank you for what you're about to build through us and in us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right. Y'all ready for the dig? If you're ready for the dig, I need you to get ready to celebrate with me. It's going to be amazing. So I'm pumped up about it. All right, let's jump right into it. First Corinthians chapter 9. Prayerfully, you did your homework. If you did your homework, I just need a thumb up in the chat. So I need a thumb up in the chats. If you did your homework, and the homework was reading chapters 9 through 16. Now, you had a whole week to get this done. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> you got this done. All right? So let's jump right into it. Pull up my notes here. And let's have some fun in 1 Corinthians. And if this dig series has been a blessing to you, don't trip. We coming back next month. So we'll conclude tonight. We'll reassemble, and then we'll give you the next topic, and you can sign up and be a part of that. I'm so pumped up about this expression in the earth. All right, let's jump out to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where I'm going to start. I'm going to hang my hat there first in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But before I get into some of that, I want to recap a little bit about where we left off with chapter 8 from last week. And so we got a chance to talk a lot about Paul's summary of, of food and sacrifice foods, what I think was what we left off before. We talked about Paul really addressing uh, some of the sexual issues in that church and things of that nature. So today we kind of really want to jump around and hone in on Paul's, um, Paul's I want to use the right words here, on Christian discipline, because we'll say that this, this latter part of the letter is very much about disciplines in Christ. It's about 
setting order. We actually see Paul shift from not just disciplinary or should I say um, uh, addressing sin primarily. He does it throughout the letter, but he's not focused on sin as much as he is order for the duration of this letter. We will see a few conversations about sin, but the rest of this letter, you're going to see him really strengthening the body about causing them to practice spiritual disciplines, if you will, and to develop a Christian discipline for their lifestyles. And so let's get ready to jump into that very quickly and um, want to make sure we're good. All right, we're all good. So in chapter nine, around verse one, Paul practices the actual principles that he is telling the church at Corinth that he needs them to move into. And so as an apostle now, he has certain rights and privileges, and he wants to share that uh, in chapter nine. And one of the rights that he talked about uh, was to be maintained by those he is preaching to. In other words, now that I'm preaching to you, I want to make sure you guys understand that I am worthy of a certain level of honor. I am worthy of recompense. I am worthy that if I come to minister to you, you should be able to share of your goods with me. It's the idea that um, that a pastor or a laborer is worthy of his reward, right? But if I'm preaching to you, ministering to you, discipling you, sharing with you the word of God and laboring over you in prayer and etc., then your response should be to make sure that my needs are met because I've given my life to you. And I think that's an easy trade-off is what Paul is saying. And as an apostle, these rights and these privileges actually belong to him is what he's saying. Then he goes on to share about how but, but he stresses that that one should subordinate one's own interests to those of others, especially those of Christ and his gospel. And he disciplines himself. And he says this in chapter nine. We'll read in a moment. He disciplines himself like an athlete in training to get a prize and to avoid being disqualified. He talks about that. And then throughout the scriptures, you'll see in the next passages that he'll expand this idea of distinguishing what is allowed from what is best. And after then, he makes a firm case of those who minister for Christ have a right to be financially supported by the people that they serve. OK. All right. So let's jump into first Corinthians chapter nine, verse one, because it's here that Paul begins to demonstrate that he has rights as an apostle to include asking them to support him financially. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse one. And I'll share my screen with you so that you can see what I'm looking at. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 1. I mean, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Look what he says here. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Now, when he says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord, he's talking about the resurrected Christ. On last week, we had been mentioned that uh, he is speaking specifically about the fact that he has been called by the resurrected Christ. His colleagues have been called by the pre-resurrected Christ, okay? So we know that by observation, we see that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, is the one that called Paul. So he says, I have not seen, uh, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Verse two, if to others I am, I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is a very incredible statement. Paul is saying that the church of Corinth is his seal. If no one else proves that I'm an apostle, your my labor with you proves that I am that, right? What a powerful statement that you are my seal. You're the seal of my apostleship. You are the seal or the proof or the, the finality, you are the, 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 the concrete evidence, there it is, that I am an apostle. You are my seal. And he tells them that, uh, that, uh, that verse 3, that my defense of those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Uh, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord? Deceive us? Let me break that down. Paul is saying, hey, I know you're okay. Let's say you do receive me. But are you saying that if, if I decide to bring a, uh, a wife with me, that you're not going to receive her as well? He's actually saying there should be uh, compensation for me enough for me to bring her with me, just like the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. He says, oh, do only Barnabas and I 
not have a right to refrain from working. In other words, so you're saying to them, to, to this church at Corinth, who may have had issues monetarily with supporting his ministry, he's saying everybody else is okay to be funded and to travel and do full-time ministry. But when it comes to me and the work that we've labored for, that myself and Barnabas, we still have to build tents. Now, here's an argument here. Paul is saying, literally, my life has been given to you. Therefore, from your life, from the overflow of your life, from the abundance of your life, right? Or from how you benefited from my life given to you, for, for uh, as, as, as in my life given to your life, then perhaps maybe you should consider being a blessing to me so that I can do the things I'm called to do. Or do you want me to still have a job or still work, right? He says, who at any times serves as a soldier at his own expense. Now I'm going to argue this for a moment. Look at verse seven. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? He said, who? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Now I want to read this in the New American Standard, okay? I love the New uh, Americans, I'm, I'm going to read the New Living Translation. I'm sorry, I misspoke. The New Living Translation. Let's go there real quick. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's get it. We're going to start around verse, what we at? Verse 6. Let's go to verse 6. Let's look at verse 6. Let's see it again. I'm going to highlight this for a moment. Get ready because we're going to have a little bit of a, a blast tonight. Let's see what the man of God says. He said, or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? Then he says, uh, let me blow this up for you guys a little bit. I don't want you to have to strain your eyes. If you're watching at home on YouTube and you got it on the screen, this should be nice and big for you. He says in verse seven, what soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of his fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking about only oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us so that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Let me just talk to you a little bit about this farming technology, especially in this era of time. So now in those days, we would bring the, well, they would bring the grain. In today's culture, we'll bring the grain inside. But in that culture, they took the grain outside and they brought it to what they call a threshing floor. And at this moment, the oxen now trampled over what was picked. So it's been picked out, it's been pruned, etc. But when they take it to the threshing floor, Oxen would purposely step on it to make sure it was completely crushed, right? So Paul's speaking of there are those who may do this, and then there are those who are oxen. There are those who are oxen, right? The one who plows, the one who plows, the one who plows, and then those who thresh out the grain, right? He says, since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? If you support others who preach to you, Shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than be an obstacle to the good news about Christ. So Paul and them made a statement here. Well, Paul's making a statement that, man, I'm so sick and tired of, I want to paraphrase a little bit, of how you guys fight the financial responsibilities. So instead of letting what you're supposed to be doing for us deter the gospel, We'll just keep on building tents and working and doing things outside of the context of ministry so that we can fund it so that what you're supposed to be doing that you have conflict with doesn't get in the way of you receiving the good news of the gospel. Wow, that's strong. I don't know if I can get with that one, but that's strong. But that's strong. That's strong. That's strong. Mm hmm. Now, we live in a whole different culture now, but that's strong right there. So Paul takes chapter nine. And he is really spending his time uh, arguing through that. Let's run on down to first chapter, uh, first uh, Corinthians chapter nine, verse nineteen. Though, let's go to verse nineteen. Let's go to verse nineteen. He says uh, in verse nineteen, and we'll read all the way to verse twenty-three. 
and then I'll exegete for a quick second, okay? All right. The man of God says, he says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring Jews to Christ. And when I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. Now, this part about being subject to the law is very tense because Paul tells us in verse 19, I'm a free man with no master. I become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And when I was with the Jews, he says, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. So when I was amongst my brethren who were Jews, I practiced the things they practice uh, so that I could win them to the purpose of Jesus. But when I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I live under the law. And even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this. It's that phrase, I'm not subject to the law. Paul is clearly introducing a doctrine. We know proof here now that Paul had introduced the gospel of grace, which is the message of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom or the gospel of Jesus or the gospel of grace, some call it, is really the gospel of the kingdom. And that is that we are not subject to, or should I say, uh, made to have to live up to the standards of all 613 laws to include dietary restrictions. Um, that now because of the grace of Christ, Christ has fulfilled the law, right? And so therefore I'm not condemned by the law um, that he has now written the law on my heart versus me trying to live out this these laws, right? And so Paul makes a statement that I'm not subject to the law. And he said, I did this so I could bring Christ to those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, did you, look, at, listen, look what I'm reading to you. When I was with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this right here is pretty interesting. Look what it says. When I, was, when I am with, read this with me, verse 21. Read verse 21. Read verse 21. When I am with the Gentiles, he says this, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. I obey the law of Christ. He says, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. He's saying, I'm not going into sin, but I'm not living by the law. Now, this is very interesting because now it would appear to me that this Jewish man by birth of the tribe of Benjamin has a revelation that he's sharing with these Gentiles in Corinth and newly converted Jews to Christianity or to the way uh, in Corinth. And that is, I don't, when I'm with you, I don't live like I have a law. That doesn't mean he lives lawless. It just means he's not following the man-made traditions and the things that were added to the law, right? Uh, if he's with the Jews and they're eating pork, I'm sure that it might not be his preference, but Paul's going to eat that He's going to eat that pork. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, um, because he understood that in this covenant, that's not what makes him righteous. Do you get it? Did I make that plain? So Paul is telling us, here I am, a, as we say in today's culture, a Messianic Jew. And this is my thought. So he's sharing with this church at Corinth these types of principles in chapter 9, these types of secrets. Let's move on to chapter 10 so I can get into some stuff that I need to get to. In chapter 10, things change a little bit more. In chapter 10, Paul is now moving to an entirely different context because now Paul is leaving the ideology of 
he's well, he's coming. He's still talking about the law, but he's moving now into the discipline aspect as it pertains to their private lives, their context, as far as sin is concerned. And so Paul is showing them through the using the the, uh, the children of Israel's plight with God and how they fell into sin and how God abandoned them pretty much in the wilderness because of them. Paul uses that as an example. So he shows the Israelites that despite their rights and their privileges, why they suffered in the wilderness. And he used what we call typological interpretation of the Old Testament. He has a typological interpretation of the Old Testament and its events. So now Paul is now about to warn his church in Corinth not to grumble or dabble with idolatry. The argument he's saying, okay, hey, I understand y'all's culture. Your culture is full of idolatry. But let me show you what happened to Israel with this same God as they yielded their members and their flesh to idolatry. As they yielded their souls to consistent idolatry and their culture with idolatry. Let me show you what happened to the church of Israel. Uh, this is Paul's advice to them. And so Paul begins to, to argue that, hey, Israel made terrible mistakes. And because they made terrible mistakes in the wilderness, God let them remain in that context. He begins by making a connection between Corinthians and the generation of Israelites that escaped from Egypt into Exodus. All right, you ready? And the same generation, how they died in the wilderness over the next 40 years. And how the rescued Israelites received the significant blessing from the Lord because he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and the, the, you know, the fire by night. And how he parted the Red Seas and how he gave them food, spiritual food, what we call manna. How he baptized them by bringing them out of Egypt into into the wilderness at that point. The baptism and the symbolic of that. How he gave them supernatural water which is symbolic of Christ and et cetera. And despite all of that, how they were still unfaithful. So Paul writes now in chapter 10, verses one through six, that uh, God was not pleased with them, uh, most of them, and killed many of them in the wilderness. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and let's look at it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you're enjoying this so far, let me know in the chats to keep moving, keep pushing. It will be very encouraging. Very encouraging. All right, there we go. I think I got it up. Y'all ready? First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Make sure my mic is right. All right. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. I'm not going to highlight this because you can see it for yourself. He said, I do not want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. He's not talking about Corinth's ancestors. He's talking about his ancestors. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. And all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. And in the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Look at verse six. These things happen as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. I'll keep reading. Or worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture said, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking and indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage, he says, in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Day. Now, in the original Greek, the phrase is actually immorality, not necessarily sexual immorality. But for continuity, I guess the writers of this and New American Standard and a few others decided to add that in there. Uh, and they will be right. But what I'm saying is just have to give you the truth. That's not there in the original uh, Greek Septuagint. It was added to help make more continuity to the text. But 23,000 people died because of all kinds of immorality. All right. You got it. All right. I want to make sure I, I put that in there just in case you learn it from somewhere else. All right. So <laughs> the question is, what did they do to earn that level of condemnation? Twenty three thousand people dead. We know a generation was wiped out from the 40 year journey. So they betrayed their relationship with God, uh, Paul says, by worshiping false idols. And then they indulged in other sins as well. 
So Paul now takes the time to summarize these other sins and explain God's judgment on those sins. He does that in verses 7 through 10. He says, um, verse, let's read it verse 9 because I read you verse 7 and 8. Let's read 9. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't, my God, died from snake bites. Let me pause there for a moment. That would suggest that while they was in the wilderness, and I know it's in the scriptures, that people die from snake bites. And Paul is saying they die from snake bites because of their sin. <laughs> Woo! It's tough in that old covenant, Jack. It is tough back there. My God, today. Even the animals are biting you, for God's sake. <laughs> you want to mess with so-and-so? Anyway, uh, they die from snake bites. And <laughs> he says, don't grumble as some of them did. I shouldn't laugh at that, right? And then they were destroyed by the angel of death. Did you? Are you reading this? And don't grumble. So they died. They died, y'all. They died. They died. They died, literally, because they were grumbling, murmuring. People lost their lives in the wilderness for complaining. Mm. He says, and don't grumble as some of them did. And then they were destroyed <laughs> by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Wow. I don't know about y'all, but that's a little bit, mm, that's hard. That's hard. That's a hard one. That's a hard one right there. Yeah, that's a hard one. Let me keep on digging. Y'all ready? All right, let's keep moving. So Paul kind of brings us to this place. Well, hey, y'all live in an adulterous, adulterous, idolatrous culture. And because it's immoral culture that you guys live in, you guys are participating in some of the immoral immorality of your culture. And because you're doing it, let me warn you, don't make the, the same mistakes that Israel made, that our ancestors made, that my ancestors made in the wilderness. God gave us that as a template to show us this is what it looks like when you make these kind of mistakes. So Paul has warned him. He's warning them. Hey, y'all, y'all don't know historically speaking, but Israel has had some issues with God and God has had some issues with Israel because of cultures like yours but he doesn't leave them without hope he takes the rest of chapter 10 and starts talking to them about the freedom in christ and it's good he spends time walking through that thing he labors in that thing he even argued the lord's table it's here to the reminder the corinthians should have nothing to do with idols and etc he warns them through this he wants them through that he warns them about their conscience and food etc but let's run through the latter half of it let's look at um uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Let's go there. And then I'll break that down, and then we'll move it to some good stuff. This is all good. We'll move to some better stuff. He says, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is solid in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, this is a big deal because in this church of Corinth, even though it's heavily Gentile, remember, as I told you guys two weeks ago, there's still a heavy Jewish con uh, con congregation there. There's a heavy concentration, there's the word, of Jews that live in Corinth, who he's saying to them, hey, all things are unlawful, all things are, uh, you know, whatever, but all things don't edify, you know, everything doesn't build you up. You can, you can do it, but don't be concerned for your own good, be for the good of others. So you may eat any food that's been sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience. For the Lord, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness or in everything in it. And if someone who is in a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. Now, in those days, uh, people didn't have the resources that we enjoy today, right? So it wasn't about clothing and giftings of that nature. It was about fellowship. The koinonia is the Greek phrase. That koinonia is not a Christian phrase. It's a Greek cultural term, right? Uh, koinonia, fellowship. People did that around food. 
So that was a cultural thing. So when somebody wanted to be kind to you, they would bring you to their home and offer you food. But now this new church world is thinking, we can't eat that. We can't eat that. That's against our dietary laws, restrictions. You know, there's a mixture here. There are Jews who are practicing this new thing called the way of Christianity. And they have been raised with dietary restrictions. They're sharing their convictions with their Gentile Greek brothers. And Gentile Greek brothers are like, well, you know what? According to us and some of the gods that we used to worship, we have certain dietary laws as well. And so now people are starting to build up walls and defenses against others because I don't want to partner with you and connect with you the way I intimately would normally because you have a different dietary system than I have and things of that nature. So Paul says, hold on, listen, y'all. We didn't, we didn't dealt with the sin issue. Y'all quit condemning people about food. Let me help you out. You can eat what you want to eat. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The fullness thereof is what the scripture actually says. And if someone invites you to dinner, have dinner with them. Eat, he says in verse 27, eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. Verse, verse 28. But suppose someone tells you this meat was offered to an idol. And he says, don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you, which means you are free to eat. You are free to eat and enjoy and et cetera. But if someone tells you, hey man, this thing was offered to the God of the God of the flies, right? Like Beelzebub, this was offered to the God of, of, of clay. Then you may say, I, you know what? If that's offensive to you, we're not going to participate with that because on your conscience, that means something. For me, I'm a little bit more free in that aspect, but I'm not going to argue how free I am. If this is your home and this is your way, this is your style, this is what you believe, I'm going to meet you at your level of conviction. Now, let me paraphrase that and bring that to modern day terms. If you go to a church and the culture in that church is for women not to wear pants, fam, this is not the time to boycott. Or this is not the time to uh, to exercise your right to wear your pants. This is the time to put on a, uh, you know, something that's not pants. <laughs> Praise God. A dress, a skirt, something because that or not go because that's you're getting in the way of how these people receive. That's their conscience. Right. That's pretty much what Paul is saying, because I think he's trying to push down self-righteousness and trying to bring people to a place of long suffering where they are caring about their neighbor and caring about that person's walking journey with the Lord. That's good. Let's go to chapter 11. Now, Paul uses those uh, examples of food to communicate a much broader perspective. He's really communicating long suffering for the sake of the gospel. And I'm going to argue this. I think he's even pulling religiosity out of a people who was heavily religious and super spiritual uh, and very carnal at the same time. Now, here's where the order starts coming in. I got five more chapters and we are out of here, y'all. This is where the order starts coming in. So now Paul is like, yo, I need to talk to my church. We got to get some things in order. There's a lot of chaos happening in our congregations and uh, there are a lot of issues. Some of the issues that he has to address are head coverings. That's a big one because culturally speaking, the women had their heads covered. And now some people are coming into a level of freedom. They uncovering that head. <laughs> and so uh, Paul talks about that. And then at the same time, there are those who should have had their hair coverage because that was the culture. Right. So Paul was saying that uh, that appropriately distinguishing women and men, uh, women and men as they pray or prophesy and worship. He talked about head coverings. So Paul praised the church at this point because they had not departed significantly from the substance of what he had previously taught. We do not have uh, the first letter of Corinth and we do not know what Paul was teaching uh, fully when he got to them. But part of the things that he did share with them was the responsibility of women having their head covered. Now, again, we're talking 55 AD, 45 to 55 AD. We're talking a long time ago, this was a cultural expression and uh, something that had to be done, especially in Corinth. This has no bearings on today. Praise God. It doesn't. So he had praise. He had no praise for what he heard about their behavior at the Lord's Supper, but he had a lot of praise about the fact that they held on to the customs of, of the women's hair, head being covered. And men also, uh, when it comes to head coverings in prayer and prophecy. All right. 
Uh, but he had an issue with how they handled the Lord's Supper. So there's two things in chapter 11 that we got to address. Number one is the whole head covering piece. We may get into that a little bit. But number two is the Lord's Supper and how they were handling this holy sacrament that Jesus had left the church. So he had no praise for that. And their action did more harm than good as it pertains to the Lord's Supper. So the Lord's Supper should be a celebration of unity. But in, in Corinth, it became divisions amongst the church divisions should have been unity it became divisive so paul repeats the words of his institution to point out that they are participating in christ's body and his blood all right let's go to first corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 and let's read it together i have one is here as you can tell looks a little different here, but I want to argue with you real quick, or not argue, but further explain this division here in this. Verse 1 is actually ending in chapter 10, and um, chapter 11 begins with verse 2, but it's still the same, same letter, okay? And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachers, I, teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have cut her hair or her head shaved, <clears throat> she should wear she should wear a covering. All right. Now this is tradition, and this is Paul's um, advice. Okay, this is Paul's advice to the church at Corinth. This is advice after grace has, grace has been administered. This is not Paul's advice. Uh, yeah, this is Paul's advice. All right, I'm going to say that. So Paul begins praising the Corinthians for remembering his teaching and maintaining the traditions he taught them when he lived there. And when he addresses in this chapter, what he addresses in the chapter, that there are two traditions which he have heard negative reports, okay? So apparently, nearly all women wore head coverings in public during this ever this era. All women wore head coverings in public during this era. This era. So I want to make you make you aware that this is not something they were trying to do for the sake of Corinth. This is something that was happening in culture. It's not happening in today's culture. So if if I or another was to tell you to have your head covered because God said so, you got to understand this is a cultural statement. So this the next few moments are cultural. They're cultural to 55 AD. You feel what I'm saying? This is back in the day. So in this time, Jewish women, pagan women, and Christian women had coverings on their head. They wore coverings on their head. If you go to the Middle East right now, if you go to certain parts of the world right now, certain customs to include certain Christians still wear, it depends on what you know how you worship, still may wear head coverings. If you're in the Islamic tradition, your head is covered. Uh, even in the Hindu uh, Indian world, um, those who live in those areas near Pakistan and India, they keep their heads covered, be it Hindu, albeit Hindu, or Muslim. They keep their heads covered. If you're Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox religions, and you're very strict in the Eastern Orthodox context, some of the women still come and lead their heads covered. It's a part of the expression of that time and that era, right? And so I want you to understand that this was cultural, all right? So women seen without head coverings may have been considered morally loose and sexually available. That was the culture of that time. You got it? So let me see if I can modernize this statement. It's like saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to get up and preach, but I'm going to wear the tightest outfit I can wear to uh to stand uh in 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 the place to to pray and prophesy that will be the equivalent 
I'm gonna have on the tightest. Uh, what they call that dress? It's the 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 the, the dress that ladies wear. Uh, body con. I'm gonna have a body con on my body. I'm gonna have a <laughs> I'm gonna have a body con on my body, and I'm gonna put this bad boy on. And when I turn sideways, the men all pause. That's what it is. I'm gonna put a body con on this body, and I'm gonna preach in this body con, and I'm gonna prophesy in this body con, and I'm gonna pray in this body con, and that. That mindset, that idea is exactly what had happened in this time and in this moment. All right. So women were considered sexually available or morally loose if they did not have their hairs covered. I was just trying to modernize it. And this was a matter of cultural assumptions. So it wasn't something that we knew for, for certain. It's just cultural assumption. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So people of Paul's era would have reacted to a woman with an uncovered head much the same way a modern people might uh, respond to a woman wearing revealing clothes. Oh, she fast. Oh, she loose. Yeah. Or men wearing, you know, inappropriate type pants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Paul received the report that some of the women in the Corinthian church were not wearing head coverings while praying or prophesying during the gatherings. To, to address this, Paul says, I'm going to build a connection between what men and women do to their actual heads and those who are metaphorical heads, which are men, representatives. This parallels the cultural concepts of what a woman's uncovered head meant to the society of the ancient world. This is why he writes that Christ is the head of every man and husbands are the head of their wives and God is the head of Christ. Okay. So this is how he decides to move into this discussion with that. We got to move on because I got three, four more chapters to cover. So let me keep on moving and it will clean his notes up because now within the next few days, we get a chance to send you everything. Well, a lot of it so that you can have it for your continued study in first Corinthians. All right, let's keep moving. All right. So matter of fact, let's go to verse seven. Let's go to verse seven. And 16 because Paul talks about the headship but let's go to 7 and 16 and then I'm gonna come back on this screen forgive me there we go you guys got it y'all stay with me somebody said and all right let's keep moving Verse seven. <laughs> All right. He says, a man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping for a man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. A woman reflects man's glory for the, the first. I'm sorry for, for the first man didn't come from the woman, but the first woman came from the man and man was not made for the woman, but woman was made for the man. And for this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head. To show she's under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men and men are not independent of women. I love that. For although the first woman came from the man, every other man was born from a woman and everything comes from God. Judge yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without her head covered? Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? <laughs> and isn't it long? <laughs> Let me stop. Pause. Oh, man. There's a lot of long hair. Isn't it long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been... <laughs> so I just had all these thoughts that just flooded my head. For it has been given to her as a covering. I might hate number all. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this and neither do God's other churches. All right. So Paul is really arguing this idea on how you should look. I don't want you sexually suggestive in your clothing. In a modern setting, I want you to be I want you to be covered. Put that in the chats. Covered, 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 covered. I want you to be covered up. Now listen, I'm not asking anybody to wear those hats on their head. Um, I'm not asking anybody to come fully covered in the sense of, but I am saying the argument Paul is making is that you don't in culture, you don't want to be, you don't want your, as my mom taught me years ago, you don't want your good 
evil spoken of. Yes, you want to make sure that people talk about you and your appearance and how you dress, that you're not a stumbling block for the brethren. And brothers, you want to make sure you're not a stumbling block for the sister. In, all right. I just made that up. But still. So the second thing Paul decides to address in chapter 11 is the issue of communion. I don't have a long time, but let's just read verses 17 through 22, 17 through 22. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you. For it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. And to some extent, I believe it. But of course, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you're not really interest, interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What? Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? You want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you, verse 23, what I have received from the Lord himself. And then he breaks down that idea of communion. We say this all the time. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given to you. This do in remembrance of me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time to go through all of that, but you get the gist of that if you've been a part of communion. What he's saying is that, man, I got a problem. Because when y'all are coming together, you even having divisions over something as sacred as the Lord's Supper. How confused can this group of men and women get? Paul explains his understanding of communion that he received from the Lord based on the knowledge he claims to have gotten from God. And many interpreters suggest that Paul, Paul to be to, to mean he obtained this information through direct revelation of Christ. Paul is saying, I got this by Rhema from Jesus himself how he told us how to format our communion and the purposes of this blood and the purposes of this food, this bread. I did not give you instructions to get drunk and to get fat off communion. Pause. I want to make sure that you're doing what's necessary to honor my body that was broken for you and my blood that was shed for you. So Paul gives them this whole rundown of, of, of communion expressing to them how to do that because people were coming. Paul even warns them that some of the Corinthians were weak and sick because they were mistreating the Lord's Supper. It's like they lived in a time where things happened. They believed that even sickness was God, God doing this. Some of y'all are sick because you've dishonored the Lord's body. You've been in here getting drunk during a sacred moment like communion. Pause right there. That's a whole break. That's a break. The argument that you can be doing something for God and be drunk doing it. I'll leave that alone. All right. So chapter 12. We didn't made it to chapter 12. In chapter 12. Y'all wake up. In chapter 12. It's really exciting because chapter 12 is where every believer, especially apostolic prophetic people, we get pumped up right here because we talking about these spiritual giftings and i don't know about y'all but i'm sure i got at least a hundred spiritual gift junkies <laughs> on this particular dig and so let's entertain each other with this in first corinthians chapter 12 now paul has set structure in order for communion he has talked to them about the way they dress women keep your head covered translation i don't want you looking like something that you're not you dig what i'm saying i know culture says that women are loose I don't want you to look like the culture. That's what he's saying. He's he's dealing with the food. He's dealing with the divisions. He's dealing with, with their conduct. He's dealing with their morality. Like, hey, y'all, we don't want to be like the children in the wild. We don't want to get lost. We don't want God to leave us. Now he's about to set the church in some order. And so Paul says, hey, y'all, man, you guys are amazing. And y'all are incredibly gifted. Let me give you some context. So in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul describes how and why God gives us spiritual gifts. And he seems to continue answering issues raised in a previous letter in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 from the context. Believers in Corinth seem to have been asking why some Christians were given spiritual gifts while others seem not to be spiritual ones. It's possible 
that some in Corinth have been demonstrating, watch this, obvious supernatural power through speaking in tongues, for instance, while others lacked this ability. So now there's tension because in Corinth, you have people who are speaking in tongues and moving in what we call power gifts. And then you had those who probably had gifts of mercy and gifts of love and gifts of administration who are thinking that their gifts are insignificant to those who had these big power expressions. Interpretation of tongues, speaking in tongues, prophecy, a major strong power gifts. And now these others are thinking that their gifts are insignificant because they're not moving in these supernatural uh, expressions. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Remember, Corinth is very spiritual and Corinth is a very supernatural place. Much of it demonic, but the church world is also now starting to move in this place of power. Not just rhetoric, but demonstration following what they say they believe. All right. So spiritual gifts like the acts of service and other godly activities come in a wide variety. So now Paul has to express to them these spiritual gifts. I want to talk about a little bit about some of the gifts that Paul unpacks a little bit in um My apologies. My camera went out when I'm switching, uh, switching pictures. Please forgive me. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. All right. So according to this particular um, in first Corinthians chapter 12, we see that Paul is now introducing the gifts of the spirit. He talks about uh, the word of wisdom. He talks about the gift of faith, prophecy, discerning of spirits, gifts of healing, diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, the uh, working of miracles the word of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So he unpacks all of this between 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. And it's pretty powerful to see him express some of that um, here. All right. So he spends his time discussing that. Let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through uh, 27. Please forgive me. Uh, for the sound issues, as I'm moving from slide to slide, I'm starting to lose sound. So it's not my fault. It's just actually happening with our software. But we're going to work this out. We're going to work this out. Thank you for letting us know. Bear with us. And just so you know, we'll probably take this down and edit it, and then we'll put it back up just so we don't have the the issues. All right. First Corinthians chapter 14 through 27. I'm going to share my screen with you. All right. I think we're there. Okay. Let's get it. He says, yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says I am not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear says I'm not part of the body because I'm the eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts. And the reason why Paul is sharing this is because people are starting to be jealous of the fact that other people are moving in what they consider to be stronger gifts. And they're frustrated with the fact that, hey, this brother's over here prophesying. Hey, this guy's moving in miracle signs and wonders. Hey, this person's interpreting tongues and etc. And uh, I don't have that kind of gifting. So they're starting to feel away <laughs> about this. So Paul has to show them that everybody's gifts and everybody's contribution with their gifts is important, whether the gift be a power gift or not. And he spends 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, from verse uh, 1 all the way to 31 arguing that. Paul concludes, though, 
by saying that at least in Corinth, the first, second, and third most essential gifted positions were the apostle, prophet, and teacher. You can write that down. He says in the scripture, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 to 31, it's important to list that out. He says that at least in Corinth, I'm going to say at least in Corinth. Now, it might be beyond that, but at least in Corinth, the first, second, and third most essential gift positions, gifted positions were the apostle, prophet, and teacher. And I think that had to be stated there because if you were a person who was prophesying with the gift, but you weren't in the office of prophet, then I think you begin to think that you are more important than the actual leadership of the house. Yeah. And so I think Paul had to say, hey, listen, listen, listen. In this church, the gifts that are the most essential to this body would be the apostle, the prophet, and the teacher. The apostle, who is Paul mm -hmm, and Barnabas, prophet, perhaps who they had as prophets, and the teachers, those who were responsible for teaching them into the way to continue in the apostle Paul's doctrine, which is the doctrine of Christ. And so now there he's he's sharing it. This is these are the most essential gifts. And then Paul ends this section with an intent to show a more excellent way. He even mentions that a more excellent way, that there's a more excellent way to do this church thing and to operate in a level of order. We're almost there, y'all. Bear with me. Chapter 13. Y'all know chapter 13. This is the love chapter. So now Paul has expressed and introduced the idea of spiritual gifts by addressing that some of them were moving in these graces. I can't imagine what Paul's ministry must have been like for five years in Corinth, that they were already prophesying, like what he was teaching them, right? I wish I could be in one of his activation classes. I'm just teasing. I don't know if they were activated or not. It, it might not even exist at that time. Once you received the Holy Ghost, you may have just by faith begin to move and exercise in your gifts. I really don't know. But much of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 corrected misunderstandings about spiritual gifts among the Christians at Corinth, that some believe that those able to speak in tongues or prophesy were more spiritual than others. So now this has created a level of jealousy and a sense of inferiority within that church context. So in chapter 13, Paul insists that every spiritual gift was uh, given by God for a reason that was essential to the church the body of Christ, and he did urge them, though, to desire that the higher gifts of the apostle, the prophet, and the teacher be given to the church, all right? So now in chapter 13, Paul is going to encourage them to believe about their gifts. So Paul begins this chapter by describing just how useless and even destructive spiritual gifts are when not applied from the standpoint of love. So he said, hey, listen, you, you jealous of this person because they're moving what you think is a more superior gift. And you, you feel like your gift is more, more, is better than their gift because you have a power gift. Let me tell you something. None of your gifts mean nothing if you don't have love. That's first Corinthians chapter 13. He comes out the gate swinging the club and he says, yo, he displays tongues, prophetic power, supernatural spiritual knowledge which is the word of knowledge may be impressive but they are worthless if not used as intended by god out of a heart full of love put that in the chat you gotta love with these gifts put that in the chat right now you must love with these gifts hey houston i love y'all even the most spiritual of activities, selling everything to give to the poor and sacrificing one's life to be burned by the sake of others, gains a person nothing if they did not do it for love's sake. In other words, there are those, he's saying, I don't care if you thought you were suffering for the sake of the gospel. If you didn't do it for love, but you did it for likes, it's not, oh Lord Jesus. If you didn't do that for love, but you did it for likes, it means nothing because you did not have love. That's First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And Paul's not just talking about any kind of love. He actually invokes a, a, a Greek word that they use in their culture that describes love. And he uses the word agapio. Agapio is the Greek word agape. We say agape in English. Agapio is the actual correct, I believe, enunciation or pronunciation of the word um, uh, love in Greek. Agapio. It speaks to God's love. This is God's kind of love unconditional, long-suffering love, supernatural love, intentional love, love beyond barriers type of love, love when you don't feel like loving. That's the agapio, that love I'll die for you type of love. Not eros, where we get our English word erotica from, which is the love that is strictly lustful. I, I love you because 
yeah, that's not that kind of love. And I'm not saying that that love is not doesn't have its place. I'm just saying that's not the kind of love God loves us with that we should love each other with. There's not the phileo, which is where we get our English word Philadelphia from, which means brotherly love. Not that my bro, my bro, not that kind of love, but the agapio, unconditional, unrestrained, supernatural, far-reaching, intentional, on purpose, with purpose kind of love. The agapio. He says that's the kind of love you got to have when you move in the gifts of the spirit. Yesterday, y'all, I did an interview for a magazine, a Christian magazine. And while I had my conversation with these incredible ladies for this Christian magazine, you'll hear about it soon, as they were interviewing me about uh, about the gifts of the spirit and whatnot, one of the questions that the lady asked me in that part of our interview, it was like a 90-minute interview, but in that part of the interview, one of the questions the lady asked me was about the prophetic. And she says, how do you move and launch the prophetic? I've been watching your ministry, watching your church. You guys move. You have a strong arm in the prophetic. How do y'all move from that? And I thought about that for a second because the, the knee-jerk response is, it's by faith or it's by intruding thought or it's by the Holy Ghost, etc." cetera. But uh, I believe everybody launches different. Listen to me here. Uh, for me, I, I try to move from compassion, right? So I may not prophesy to everybody, but if I look at a person and my heart leaps for that person, I prophesy to that person. It's leaping from a place of, uh, from compassion, right? And so I believe love has to be at the root of all spiritual gifts. If you don't love, don't prophesy. Yeah, yeah, don't prophesy. Don't prophesy. If you hate, don't prophesy. If you have preferences, don't prophesy. You have judgments, don't prophesy. Keep that to yourself until you get your lens cleared out. So Paul says, hey, if you're going to move in gifts, you got to have the agapio. You got to see people, or at least try to see people the way God sees people. Then he starts explaining love. He says it's patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast. Love doesn't uh, keep record. Love is not arrogant. It's not superior. It's not rude. It doesn't mean that it doesn't act indecent. It doesn't break cultural norms or bring one attention to oneself. Paul says when you love with the agapio, right, it's always preferring other people. It's genuinely commit yourselves to seeking the good for others. That's the kind of love. So he argues this whole thing of love, which you think, hey, he's not really preaching about spiritual gifts. He's really giving them, should I say, structure around the gift. I know y'all are gifted, but y'all don't even like each other. <laughs> I know y'all are gifted, but y'all can't stand each other. I'm going to need you to fall in love with each other. Fall in, hey, hey, to fall in the agapio with, with one another so that God can utilize your gifts so that he can build this church. Not just the church of the Corinth, but the kingdom of God. And that's our warning today. We got to fall in love, not just with the gospel. We got to fall in love with each other. Amen. Put that in chat. It is so. It is so. Now, chapter 14, Paul's instructions get a little bit more detailed, a little bit more explicit, and he's a little bit harder. I'm almost there, y'all, as I come to my close. Paul's instruction to the Corinthians about spiritual gifts began in chapter 12, but it concludes in chapter 14. So in chapter 12, he's arguing about spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, he's giving them a level of structure around it about where they should launch from, that love should be at the crux of all that they do, as gifted as they are, and that your gift is not more superior than this person's gift. And for those that feel like that is, you don't love. And if you don't love, don't move in this because it does not work. It means nothing. Your gift may still be employed. But it means nothing if you don't love. You got it? So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. I'm going to turn there as quick as I can. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. He picks up where he left off. I'll share my screen with you. He literally picks up, picks up where he left off. And Paul says something profound. He says, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For you, if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people don't want, since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be all a mystery. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, comforts them, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. 
but one who speaks the word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Let's look at verse five. I wish you all could speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Let's keep reading. Verse six, we almost there. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in any unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation of some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching that will be helpful, even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly, or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, or the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, my apologies, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It's the same for you. If you speak to the people in words they don't understand, how would they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty space. I don't have time to unpack all of that. Much of that was self-explanatory in the New Living Translation. But Paul is saying, hey, guys, I want you to prophesy. I want to argue this. I would say the first apostolic, prophetic, apostolic church in the body of Christ was probably Corinth. I would argue, I would argue theologically speaking, based upon what we just saw, what we just read, that the first apostolic or prophetic apostolic ministry for, it, as a church, not just individuals, but as a church, is more than likely Corinth. Corinth would be the blueprint to some degree of not how to build a prophetic apostolic church, but some of the warnings and instructions you must give a prophetic apostolic people. I would say Corinth would be that church. I would go online and purposely say that Corinth became an Acts 2 church. At least that was the, the, uh, the model of Paul. The beautiful part is they also had the grace message versus Peter's churches. They had the grace message. So I think we're more like Corinth in this culture than um, like any other church in the body. Corinth and Galatians. All right, let's keep moving. I'll do that, Lord. All right, so Paul never dismisses or discounts the gift of speaking in tongues, but his instructions seem to indicate that the gift was being misused in the Corinthian church services. From the context, we can imagine that many people were speaking in tongues at once with nobody interpreting what was said. Pause. Imagine being in church and everybody's in church and they walk in. And the song is sung and we all just speak in tongues and there's no concentrated effort of what we're praying about. We're just talking in tongues. And that's exactly how church man went. Can you imagine being in church for an hour and everybody just standing up looking at each other speaking in tongues? <laughs> it's because they were excited about these gifts. <laughs> so tongues were being used mostly for praying out loud to God in unknown languages. But Paul was concerned that, hey, as these churches are starting to grow and this message of the gospel is getting out, we want to make sure that when they come through these doors, they understand what we're talking about. Praise God. Now, again, culturally speaking, we're talking about an hour where the gospel was something brand new. In today's culture, people have heard the gospel. We have the fortunate luxury of being able to come to church on Sunday with like-minded believers. In that time, they were trying to get to that place. You see the context? We're fortunate. Put that in the chat real quick. I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. This is why you got to come to church because we're fortunate. So once we get down to 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18, though, Paul talks a little bit more about the gift of prophecy. On the other hand, he involved revelation from God. He says prophecy is a revelation from God to an individual for the purpose of communicating that message to the church. And that when that gift is exercised, we read it how the whole church benefits or how the, how the whole room benefits from prophecy. He moves on uh, around verse 20, I believe, to verse 25. And uh, he's talking about unbelievers exposed to the gift of prophecy. On the other hand, may fall under the conviction about their sin and come to faith in Christ, recognizing God at work among the Christians. So now Paul spends chapter 14 literally bringing order to these spiritual gifts. 
So chapter 12, he acknowledges it. Chapter 13, he gives them foundation. It, where you're launching from, what, what, what it means to have this. So calm down. Y'all aren't that special, but our love, it means nothing. But in chapter 14, he starts giving them a sense of orderly worship, what this must look like. Paul follows his teaching with specific commands about how the Corinthians should conduct themselves in church. He describes it as a series of voluntary presentations, each in turn, one at a time. Hey, slow down. He says, hey, you might bring a hymn. You bring a lesson. Another one gives a prophecy uh, by the gift of prophecy. Another one gives a message. So you you bring the hymn. You sing the hymn. You you pray. You you give a message. It's almost like he's creating a order of service for the church at Corinth. Okay. So Paul says, as those with the gift of tongues are free to speak as well, but only if someone with the gift of interpretation of tongues, including the speaker, is available. Now again, when we pray in the spirit within our churches and our context. I need to argue this here, especially for those of us who come from uh, cessationist backgrounds, if you will, or certain denominations or at least theological thoughts that no one is supposed to speak in tongues at all in church. And I, I, I've i heard you and I hear you. It's this particular scripture from people who do not operate in power gifts like to hang on to this and try to diminish or demean, etc. Now, can it be confusing for somebody who comes in off the street, never seen this expression before, come into a church and be completely taken aback? Oh my God, it's speaking in tongues. Yes, it can happen. It can happen. However, we live in a culture now where the gospel has, I'm not going to say it's saturated America because it has not, but the gospel is still being preached and more people are aware of it before. They are aware to receive and they are aware to reject. I do believe that in every church, there should be a level of honor and order as it pertains to spiritual gifts. We should not be running roughshod, going crazy with our spiritual giftings. We should have a level of order within our service. So uh, I, I believe in that. However, if a person is praying in tongues to themselves, I do think we've arrived at least in different expressions to a place where you can pray amongst yourselves. You can pray aloud, but if you're in that room and you're coming to this expression, something in you kind of believes. So we have so many churches in America versus the time of Corinth, where that may have been one of the only house churches or maybe public spaces that they were able to come to under the same canopy. But in our context, you've got a church on every corner. So <laughs> it's just a different culture. So in the cultural aspect, uh, in the cultural aspect of that time, I fully understand and fully agree with Paul and still agree with Paul in this context, depending upon your church's culture. Amen. So finally, he concludes again. He goes back to the women in chapter 14, verses 34 through 35, and he talks about their participation in the services. I don't have time to break this down, but he commands that the wives be silent. Save your questions about the proceedings. For your husbands when you're at home and these restrictions have to be more have more to do with the marriage relationship than the role of a woman in service now i want to argue that here because paul's trying to bring order to the headship remember god is the head of the man the man is the head of the woman or the wife and christ is the head of the church you know it's it's, it's this whole thing so he's trying to and 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 god is the head of christ he's trying to bring a level of order of order to these marriage relationships. Hey wives, this is not the time. When your husband gets home, you can ask him about the proceedings and the why and the why and such. Again, this is the culture of that day. He's just bringing honor and bringing, um, he's bringing honor and he's bringing, he's making the gospel fit within the culture without compromising the gospel. In today's culture, we try to bring the gospel into the culture, but we compromise the gospel to do it. Paul is saying, I'm not going to water down the gospel, but I'm going to bring it into the culture so that you don't have confusion in your homes or confusions, confusion in the culture. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. So Paul, early in the letter, allowed women to offer prayers or prophecies. He believed in that if their heads were covered. We just saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But the purpose here seems to be similar to not give a conflicting, confusing message. So Paul concludes the chapter by stating again, his two essential principles for worship. Christians in a given congregation cannot claim, he says, spiritual privileges or knowledge over other believers. That's the first thing. 
and that all are subject to the same test and truth. That's the second thing, that everything we do must be in love. I got two more chapters. I'm going to run through them. Chapter 15 now. He talks about a lot here, but I'm going to see if I can move through this as fast as we can. Paul writes this chapter to correct their thinking, teaching about what resurrection from the dead means for born again believers. Because again, in this culture, people are born again, or I'm sorry, people are uh, have um, belief systems, that's the word, about what happens to the, to the dead. And so Paul wants to say, hey, I need you to know what we believe in our faith and our understanding concerning those who have departed. He begins by reminding the Corinthian Christians of what they believe when he taught them the gospel of Jesus. And they believed in both the death of Christ for their sins and the physical resurrection of Christ from the dead on the third day. And in short, they believed the gospel, okay? So since so many eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection were still living at that time, the Corinthians could choose to remain confident that Christ did indeed walk alive out of his tomb. Now, that had to be very powerful to know that the 12 or members who were connected to the 12 or to just know that they existed, that people who actually walked with Christ could tell them, they know, he got out the grave. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was uh, 25 years old and Jesus was resurrected, I can see some of the disciples saying, I can remember we went back to his tomb. He wasn't there. And uh, because remember, these guys are only in their 60s and 70s by the time this church is existing. So these men have history with this story and not just the 12. Watch this, beloved. But so many who had escaped or left uh, parts of Ro uh, Roman province, uh, Roman government had left. It. Even even watch this. Even Roman soldiers and people who were part of Rome who left that time who wrote stories and told stories about what Jesus had actually did. So we're living in a time where there was infallible proof, not just from the 12, but from other people that had heard about it or people who saw the crucifixion or people who were there when the earth shook, people who were there when the veil was rent, people who were there when the darkness, gross darkness came upon the earth. They had eyewitnesses to back that up. So Paul had to remind them, hey, remember why you believe. Remember, remember the proof that you had. Be like, you're right. We do believe it. We heard it. We heard it. So having established that the Corinthians do, uh, do believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus the dead, Paul then challenges their unbelief in the coming resurrection of all who trust in Christ. Because at that time, they could believe that Jesus was resurrected. They just had difficulty believing that those who die in Christ will be resurrected. So but he begins to show why this is so significant by working out the logical implications of believing that there is no resurrection from the dead. It starts with this. If nobody's resurrected, resur I'm sorry. If nobody is resurrected from the dead, this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. I'll go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, chapter 15, 12 and 13. But tell me this, he says, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. Now, I'm going to pause there for a moment. I need to pause there for a moment. Paul is literally saying, if there's no resurrection from the dead for Christ, then there's no resurrection from the dead for us. And if there's no resurrection from the dead for us, then there is no resurrection from the dead for Christ. So, we ought to believe in our own resurrection when this is over with, just like we believe in Christ. We ought to believe that way. So, yeah, that's where he's arguing. And they're like, okay, we get that. All right, we fully accept that. Paul goes on through that. You can read it for yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to run on to my eternal close. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. In this final chapter, Paul's long letter to the church of Corinth, he gives instruction about special collection and shares his upcoming travels. So in this season of his ministry now, Paul was raising funds for the Jews or the Christian Jews living in Jerusalem. Now, this is important to some degree 
because Jerusalem is very special to the kingdom of God. Um, as you know, there's a war happening right now uh, with between um, uh, the Israeli government uh, and um, and Hamas. Uh, there's a there, you know these are uh, people from the Sunni state, a Sunni Islamic uh, movement that is uh, somewhat revolutionary, fighting for the freedom of Palestine from apartheid-like conditions, which I believe, which we know is true. And they have been in that place for a very long time. Uh, let me just say this as well. As a Christian, it is our responsibility to pray for, or to bless Israel and to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, I know my Bible says that, but the audience of that letter, or the audience of that statement, rather, from the prophet, uh, was Israel itself. Yes, uh, he was not talking to the, to Gentiles or to New Testament believers at that time. It's an old covenant statement. Uh, that's just context and audience. I have to give you that. But number two, we're still praying for the peace of Jerusalem because it does matter. Um, secondarily, uh, and I want to say this with great respect and great honor, uh, great reverence for the things of God, because at the same time, there are Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Jews. Hamas, though they be from Palestine, do not represent the interests of all Palestinians. And so what's happening is even there in Jerusalem now is you're seeing um, Zionist Israel to some degree in the government. Yes. And members of Israel's government and cabinet who believe to include the um, prime minister or former prime minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, who believes that we are to annihilate our, 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 our enemies there. Uh, so that we can claim much of this area uh, and prepare ourselves for the return of the Messiah, right? That's uh, the theory of Zionism. It starts in Jerusalem, but the preparing for um, for the for the for the um, the Mishak, the Mishak, and in Islam it's the Mahdi, but in 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 Hebrew it's the Mishak. And that idea behind that is that um, is that we make this the holy city for Jews and for Judaism. You get it? Uh, not Christianity and not Islam. Yes? Um, yeah. And so as a believer, let me just say this to you as your pastor or for those who are watching online, I'm not your pastor, but you know, but I still want to share this as a, as a Christian, as a brother in the faith, is that Christians can do two things at once. You can pray for Israel and you can also pray for the innocent people in Palestine. Amen. And if somebody takes your card, um, they're not Christians anyway. All right, let's keep moving. <laughs> and I mean every bit of that. Um, so now these Christians are suffering, in the, in the Jews in Jerusalem are suffering through persecution for their faith in Christ. It's similar to now, as well as extreme poverty. And Paul was collecting donations from many of the Gentile churches who had helped to establish, including who he had helped to establish, to include the church in Corinth. So he spends 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, talking about that. And for the sake of integrity and transparency, Paul did not plan to touch the money himself. Instead, he told the church to appoint and accredit some to carry the gift to Jerusalem and they could travel with him if that seemed like a good idea. Look at the integrity of Paul. Then Paul reveals his plans to return to Corinth to spend time with them before the following winter. And so he wrote this letter from Ephesus and plan to travel from there to the churches in Macedonia after Pentecost before arriving to spend the winter with them. And in the meantime, the door in Ephesus was open to effective ministry, even as many were opposed to the gospel. Paul concludes this letter with a group from the church at Corinth, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaius had come to visit Paul in Ephesus perhaps bringing with, the letter, bringing with them the letter Paul had been replying to this, to, replying to in this letter. And Paul commends the household of Stephanophis um, to the Corinthians as the first converts to faith in Christ in the region of Corinth and devoted servant leaders. He tells the Corinthians to submit to their leadership. And then Paul signs off in this letter with the greetings. You can find this in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 19 through 24. I know I'm rushing. But Paul signs off with greetings from the churches in Asia, which is defined, then includes Ephesus. And these are also sent from Aquila and Priscilla, former members of the Church of Corinth, 
And from all the believers known to Paul, he finishes by taking the pen from his scribe and writing a curse and a blessing in his own hand. He curses anyone with no love for the Lord and prays for the grace of Christ to be with everyone else. And he adds an urgent prayer um, that the Lord will return and declares his love for all of them who are in Christ Jesus. You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 19 through um, uh, 24. As a matter of fact, I'll share this last time with you on my screen, just so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. It's right here. Paul literally writes this in Greek. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. He says, if anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Oh, Lord, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. It's that phrase, though. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow, what a statement. Okay, I guess we're open up for questions. Do we have any questions for tonight? As you are turning there, I hope you all were blessed. Man, we have just knocked out all of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 16. Y'all, we knocked that out. We did it together, y'all. And that was a lot. I don't know about y'all, but were y'all excited about that? Were y'all excited about that? I know I was. Man. To be excited about. And so I want to make sure that we can ask any questions real quick. I've got time to answer two or three. And then... I am going to wrap it up and then get prepared for the next dig. So matter of fact, do me a favor. As you're putting in questions, I want you to also tell me, hey, what other letters or books or whatever in the scripture or even subjects would you like for me to, to address? Maybe things we can discover together. So let me know. I'm looking, taking ideas, taking, um, taking suggestions from God's people. So you tell me and I will jump in there. And uh, and I will make sure that we get that down. Let me know, y'all. I'm waiting for y'all. What you got? What you got? What you got? Let me know what you got. And let's keep it moving right to there. I'm excited about this, man. That was a lot. And um, I hope you guys got it. Amen. Definitely a blessing. All right. All right. So while you're putting things into the chat, let me just remind you again on tomorrow night is going to be incredible. Uh, I got my, my pastor is going to be here on tomorrow night with us for the Legacy Conversations. Again, I want you to be here on tomorrow night, if you can, uh, at, Re at, at our church at The Rock. Uh, he is the pastor of Redeeming Grace Christian Church. On um, I was there for a very, very, very long time. And uh, for 12 years, gave my life to that ministry, etc., God is so good. And uh, so I want you to be with us on tomorrow. We're going to have our very first legacy conversation. So if you're not doing much, Rock Family, I want to see you in the building. Let, let the bishop know we appreciate him and all that good stuff. It's going to be fun. We will be taping it. So I want you to be there. No dress code. Just come. Um, ladies, just come like the women of Corinth. Just come with your head covered. And that's going to be good. I'm teasing, y'all. I'm, I'm really teasing. All right. Let's get back to this. All right, I see the suggestions coming in, and some of the suggestions we have coming in are, can we talk about the end times? All right, end times, okay. Uh, Natasha Brown says, Apostle, nothing with the dig, but I'm ready to move back to San Antonio. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, praise God, praise God. Uh, the woman of God says the book of Ephesians. You know what? Ephesians is definitely on my heart. I see. Uh, let's go forward. Let's see here. It says a question from a. I don't see the question. Yeah, there's no pending on mine. It's pinned on YouTube. All right. All right. So let's see here. Can you teach on Job or Joseph? And if we did a case study, excuse me, if we did a case study uh, on the life of Job and Joseph, yes, we can do that. Um, are you talking about the book of Job? Or are you talking about 
a case study on the life of Job and the life of Joseph. Because Joseph is a, these are two biblical characters. Job is the only one with a book. So I'm assuming you're talking about a case study. So yeah, we actually can can dream into that. Um, I like to review the book of Isaiah. Whew, it's going to take longer than three weeks, my God. Uh, Mary Banfield says, what is God's position on cremation? Mm, this is what I think about God. Um, and this is just my humble opinion. Uh, when he resurrect us, if you were cremated, I got a feeling that whatever insect, if, especially if they, I want to be, I want to be very sensitive here. Um, you know how people like to, uh, scatter ashes and things of that nature. I've always wondered like, what if they scattered somebody in the water? I just feel like he just gonna put you back together again. That whatever gave you up, or whatever ate, whatever consumed you, whatever tree that you was, um, whatever whatever yard you was scattered in, right? That gave fertilization to whatever. Uh, none of it really goes anywhere. All of it goes into the earth. So I believe he'll put you back together again. Um, I really do. I, I don't think he needs that to 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 bring you back, right? Um, you are a spirit and not necessarily just flesh. So that's my thought on that. Revelation and Israel. Revelations, the book of Revelations and Israel. Revelations, I see that. Uh, let's see here. I see a lot of revelations here. I see a lot of revelations here. Okay, revelations. All right. Well, I got some of your suggestions. And um, I appreciate all of them. Let's see. How does headship work for a non-believing spouse? Does the woman, A-T-T-E, how does headship work for a non-believing? I can answer the first question to the best of my ability. How does uh, headship work for a non-believing spouse? The Bible says, let's say, for instance, the husband is non-believing, right? Um, and she becomes a believer. The scripture says that the wife sanctified the household. And so because she sanctified the household, um, she is to still honor, uh, her husband and her marriage. And I'm talking about in a godly way, not in a non-godly way. Um, but if, he, if he's asking her to sin, then she can't participate with that. But if in fact, um, um, he is not enticing her to, to, to sin, right? And she is to be married to her husband, to honor her husband in an honorable way that pleaseth the Lord. And the scripture says she's the one that sanctifieth or sets the household apart. Um, I believe, and I'm going to say this to any woman who's married who's or any person who's with a person who doesn't believe, is that um, if you honor the person that you, you, you chose in the sense to where uh, you, they were perhaps a non-believer, maybe you weren't at the time either, and you became a believer, I believe God gets in partnership as long as you continue to to um, to honor and to um, to live in a way that brings glory to him in your personal life. I believe God gets in partnership with that with that person for the soul of the person in question. I do. I honestly believe heaven will back you up in that case. Um, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Also, when it comes to. Um, does the woman go to an elder? Um, I mean, that person can. I don't, you know, if, if you're married to an unbeliever and you go to an elder, I, I, I want to make sure I'm answering the question right. Um, yeah, but I just believe you should honor the marriage, honor the relationship, uh, honor the union, especially if that person is a non-believer and, and you are the believer. I think a lot of men, especially, at least from the 25 years I've been preaching, what I've been able to see, um, throughout my, my journey is that oftentimes um, some men don't come because that woman, and I want to be careful here, does not necessarily live out the disciplines of Christ or there's not a change in who she is, right? So why be different if you still come home and fight and argue and cuss me out? Um, you know what I mean? And so I think when the unbelieving spouse or the carnal spouse, if you will, sees the change, the positive change in the believing spouse, uh, then the sanctification process of the non-believing person, um, at least the fight for their soul, I believe it begins. I believe heaven backs that up. I really do. All right, let me keep moving. 
Kimberly Husband. The rest of the question, Apostle, is does the wife take her questions to the elders of the church? Okay, good. Does the wife take the question, her questions to the elders of a church? I guess it's in context to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, discussion about whether women should speak in church and things of that nature. Um, I think it's always safe to have a question with, with an elder. Yeah, especially if the, if the spouse doesn't believe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, an elder, a deacon, um, but not just an elder or deacon, but maybe an established Christian, one who you see is moving um, in a level of, you know, um, you know, discipline in the kingdom and things of that nature. But yeah, you can take, definitely take it to an elder or a minister, an associate minister, someone who may know and uh, can give you clarity. Definitely your pastor. Um, depending upon the church size and things of that nature. Yeah, definitely. Yes, men become unequally yoked. Right. If you're married to a non-believer, that's definitely an unequally yoked relationship. It definitely is. Mm -hmm. For certain. Yeah. Anitra says she's seen it firsthand. Monica, I think that scripture is actually in 1 Corinthians. Okay. Okay, I think that's everything. Guys, I love y'all. Thank you so much for your time on tonight. Let's clap it up one more time. So again, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow night for Legacy Conversations. Uh, we will be streaming it as well, but I definitely want to have a studio audience on tomorrow night. Uh, dress casual. It's going to be a good time of conversation. Um, you know, some interviews. So you're going to be able to really hear some, some, my some mystery and some history from the man of God. I love y'all so very much, and we'll be back in about two weeks with a brand new dig. So make sure you share this. Go back and look at it. If you already signed up for notes and things of that nature, we'll make sure we concise it because it's going to be a lot to give it to you so that you can benefit um, from this time. I hope y'all were blessed. If you were, please let me know. Hit me up on the socials, man. You can find me on Instagram at Kevin Duhart. You can find me on Facebook at Kevin D. Duhart. I'm everywhere, Kevin Duhart. Hook me up, look me up, follow me, uh, put, put this out there, let people know. Also, subscribe on the Dig page. I love y'all. I will see y'all very soon. Peace, y'all.